Now, we should not be surprised when some political leaders purposely make wrong and even evil decisions to protect their own interests. Pilate and the religious leaders demonstrated how far some in authority can and will go to protect themselves. See, Pilate knew why Jesus stood before him. He knew the religious leaders in Israel were envious of him. Therefore, he knew that even Herod found no charges against Jesus to keep him in custody, custody, let alone be worthy of death. We're going to take a turn here to visit another ugly moment in human history that in some ways this account is really connected to, particularly particularly the declaration of the uh, uh, Israel people in saying that the blood would be on them and their children. In the 1900s, and actually many, many, many years before that, Christians had been persecuting Jews due to their belief that Jews were responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus by their own words. Because of their ingrained notion that Jews deserve to be punished for failing in their role as the original, originally chosen people of God, and because of the ideal that Christianity had replaced Judaism. It is within this mindset we enter into the relationship between Christianity and Nazism, which was complex, complex and often antagonistic. Now, according to my research, Nazi the ideology rejected many liberal ideals and Christian concepts with Hitler reportedly declaring that Christianity as the heaviest blow that ever struck humanity and viewing it as a Jewish invention. In general, the Catholic Church's attitude toward the Nazi persecution of Jews during the Holocaust was rather indecisive. The official agreement made between the Vatican and the uh, uh, and Nazi Germany in the mid 1900s uh, or mid 1933 made it impossible for large groups of German uh, Catholics to get together and protest the Nazi activity. As a rule, the church was more interested in protecting itself and its members than saving Jews. Thus, the church was silent, and in that. It was their moment of crying out, give us Barabbas. Moderates in the uh, Protestant church may have opposed the Nazi actions, but they wanted to avoid a fight. So they were willing to compromise with the German government. And at the same time, a movement called the German Christians arose among Protestants aimed at closer ties with the Nazis. The German Protestant Church dealt with the problem of Nazi interference into its affairs differently, and it caused a split in that organization. The German Christians now were prepared to follow the Nazis' orders at all costs, and even demanded that all Jewish elements be removed from Christian prayers and rituals. The German Christians wanted to unite the 28 regional Protestant bodies under one single bishop, and they elected a ferret Nazi to this post. They also introduced the Fuhrer principle into the church government and adopted the Aryan paragraph, which called for the dismissal of all people of Jewish origin from church positions. When Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party rose to power in early 1933, the timid majority of Protestant ministers obeyed Hitler's commands without open protest. In fact, many church groups in Germany, both Catholic and Protestant, supported the new government. They did so for several reasons. First, the Nazis claimed that 
they would support positive Christianity and thus won the backing of many Christian groups. The Nazis developed a document of anti-Semitism that targeted Jews as the source of modern evil, including capitalism and Marxism. In response to Nazi ideology, some Protestant uh, groups in Germany, known as the German Christians again, attempted to synthesize Nazism and Christianity during Hitler's reign, but they were unsuccessful. So to counter the German Christian movement, a group of ministers formed the Pastors Emergency League and set up an alternative church government known as the Confessing Church. The Confessing Church planned no campaign of resistance to Nazism. It was mainly directed against the uh, distortions of the German Christians. And in fact, the leaguers repeatedly affirmed their loyalty to the state and congratulated Hitler on his political move. Because Lutherans traditionally supported the ruling power, the confessing church decided not to set itself up as a rival against Nazism. I can't help but wonder as I think and look back on the church history, and I pray that it's not repeating itself today, but I don't hear the outcry against what's happening in our society and to other human beings in our societies being labeled as garbage and trash and and being lied upon and ridiculed and targeted. And the church is quiet. As I mentioned earlier, the Catholic Church tried to solve the problem by making an official agreement with the Nazis. In July 1933, the Vatican Secretary of State signed an agreement with Nazi Germany, which stated that the Vatican recognized the political legitimacy of Nazi Germany in exchange for a guarantee that the Nazis would not interfere with Catholic institutions and religious schools. Six years later, that very same man who signed that agreement was elected the Pope of Rome. When it was obvious that Hitler's attempt had failed to unite the Protestant churches, he turned more and more to his anti-Christian Nazis who claimed that Nazism itself represented the true fulfillment of Christianity. Uh, There's a redefining that took place then that we can hear starting to form even today. In 1935, the Nazis created their own Ministry of Church Affairs under a Nazi lawyer. When he met resistance from churchmen, he declared, National, and I'm quote, national socialism, yeah, is the doing of God's will. God's will reveals itself in German blood. True Christianity is represented by the party. It has always been easy to declare that something or someone is God's will. But the greater question that should follow is whether it is God's accepted or perfect will. Israel's desire for a king like other nations had caused God to appoint Saul as king, who failed in his position. This was not the perfect will of God. This was not in God's original plan, but it was because the people cried out for it. It was his accepted will. Let's move on. Pilate is an example of religious ignorance. He really knows very little about the Jews or the things of God. 
And there is a certain kind of person who might be highly educated, uh, 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 high social status, uh, uh, an important personality figure in society, and yet is entirely clueless of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are clueless and bewildered at what is even happening in the spirit realm. Pilate had enough sense to see that Jesus is really not guilty of anything worthy of death. Yet, he is completely bewildered by the things of God. And such people need teaching. And Jesus, here he is standing before him being judged, was still willing to help Pilate. However, the people of Israel rejected Jesus with their eyes wide open. Their rejection of Christ was much more serious than serious than Pilate's because they knew or claimed to know, which is even worse. God has established government to be his servant to all people in all places at all times. This servant role applies to those who occupy positions of leadership and government as well as to the government structures themselves. So these leaders, pagan though they may be, become God's servants to uh, maintain law and order in a sinful world that would deteriorate into chaos without this divine plan. We experience what some of that chaos can look like on January 6th. And because of this, Christians are to submit to the the governing authorities that have been delegated from God. Now, practically speaking, this means paying our taxes and other financial obligations and demonstrating respect and honor, uh, even though we may disagree with the government leaders' lifestyle and decisions. Also, one of our main responsibilities is to pray for these leaders. This does not mean, however, that we are obligated to submit to these leaders when they order us to violate God's will and God's principles. We still serve a higher authority. As I said before, I am first and foremost a citizen of his kingdom, and I have co-citizenship in the United States. Now, Jesus made this clear when he taught those who were under Roman authority to give back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When Jesus commanded uh, his apostles to proclaim his death and resurrection in Jerusalem and the Sanhedrins told them to stop, they responded, we must obey God rather than men. And I'm going to go back to to, to what what Jesus told them regarding their responsibility as citizens in Rome. He said to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to give God what belongs to God. My question to you is, what do you feel you have that belongs to God? And before you say everything, really think about that. Because some have given their heart to someone else or something else. Whether it's fear or greed. Anyway. Let's move on. We pay a penalty for obeying uh, uh, the government rather than God. We also will pay a penalty on obeying God rather than the government. The question is, which penalty are you willing to accept? (laughs) The apostles were flogged. James paid the ultimate price for his civil disobedience. We read that in Acts chapter 12. As many, many Christians throughout the centuries have paid a price. 
God has never guaranteed that these government servants or you and I will not deteriorate into or may already be evil people. See, what, what determines that is our willingness to continue yielding to the, to the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit and the reading and studying of God's word and then acting that out, playing that out, working that out. Amid heaviness of heart, which is understandable and expected, May I share one of the scriptures? I'm putting some of that weight on that I have. And it's in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, which says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire, but when the desire is fulfilled, it is a tree of life. A hope deferred is a universal experience. In the book of Romans, hope is presented as a central theme of the gospel, with believers encouraged to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. This hope is not necessarily about deliverance from present suffering, but rather finding strength through it, leading to endurance, leading to character, and a deep confidence in God. <coughs> Something deferred means it's been put off, it's been delayed, it's been suspended. And for those of us, especially in this age, this microwave age, anything put off, anything delayed, anything that is not instant, irritates us. But the longer a person goes without seeing their hope realized, the more likely they are to become discouraged. Seeing one's hope become uh, 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 more and more distant and even uh, foster anger and fear and resentment. Yet seeing one's hope coming to pass is uplifting. And many passages of scriptures are pleased to God, asking him to bring about promises which seem to have been deferred. For some of us, like the Jews and some of the Christians of the 1930s under Nazi Germany, uh, like the followers of Jesus Christ and the decision of Pilate, our hope has been deferred. It has been pulled away. How are we going to handle it? I believe that as long as we keep our hope, our faith, our desire and courage together, we will prevail and function in the perfect will of God. And this is my prayer and my belief, and I'm sticking to it. In the book of Psalms, chapter 34, uh, verses 15 and 19, it says, <clears throat> the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. I want to do something different today and clothed in prayer. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Father, it is in this time of confusion and anger and concern and anxiety, I call for the stirring up and the manifestation of the virtues of courage, hope, strength, and wisdom you have placed in us. Take this moment of prayer to make an occasion of encouragement. And in this occasion, we acknowledge the reality of fear, concern, and discouragement. We acknowledge them so that we can, with your help, subdue them in the name of Jesus. 
Father, we seek a level of encouragement that can only come from you. Encouragement is said to be the fuel of hope. It provides the ability to keep moving forward when our hope is deferred. Father, you told us in your written word, all these things happening would happen. Therefore, everything that is happening is no surprise to you or out of your control. So we shall focus and set our hearts and minds on the things that are before us, on the coming of daybreak. For our weeping will endure for a night, but we are looking and expecting the joy that's coming in the morning. So in the meantime, strengthen us, Holy Spirit, to be receivers and providers of a touch a smile, a kind word, a listening ear, an honest compliment, or the smallest act of caring, a prayer, a sharing of scripture or testimony. And we will thank you for it, Father, for in those things we will find strength, we will find comfort. For your word tells us, Father, that our testimony is has power in it. So, Father, we will share the testimony of your goodness, your faithfulness, your compassion, your love, your breakthrough power and authority with others so that they can be encouraged and we will be encouraged ourselves through the word of our testimony. I thank you in advance now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed the ride today. Please take a second to to like us, subscribe to this channel for more of this kind of context. Hit the notification button so you can be notified when some new content has been placed on the site. If you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, click on the button above labeled Prayer of Salvation or the link below in the description section. Otherwise, I thank you again for spending some of your time with me. And as always, peace and blessings to you and your household.